From the 27th of March to the 23rd of April 2003, 20 years ago to this day, Walking with Cavemen was released. This series is often considered the black sheep of the Walking With series, and I can't lie, I feel like that title is kind of deserved. This was the first series made without Tim Haynes and Impossible Pictures as a whole, and it kind of shows. Now, I don't think Cavemen is bad, but it really does pale in comparison to the other stellar series, to a point where it feels more like a spin-off to me. It's possible that Impossible Pictures were busy making sea monsters during Cavemen's production, as both series came out in 2003. So, if foregoing Impossible Pictures was Cavemen's first sin, the second was definitely replacing Nigel Marvin with Sir Robert Winston. Who does that? In this incredibly niche subgenre, Nigel Marvin is the guy. Not to say nobody else can do it, but you can't replace Nigel. I hope he was at least compensated for being cut. I wonder who he speaks to about his expenses. Apparently, in the North American version, it's Alec Baldwin? I don't bloody know. The formula this time around is a bit different, as there are four episodes rather than the six of Dinosaurs and Beasts. Whilst I usually dedicate an entire video to each episode, I'm just going to do the one for Cavemen, for reasons I'll get into later. A big difference is that most of the effects are practical rather than CG. If you remember in my review of Walking With Beasts' fourth episode, Next Up Kin, one of my main complaints was that the CG ape men just were not very convincing. Caveman remedies that by exploring the exact same time and place in its first episode, First Ancestors, specifically focusing on the Australopithecus specimen nicknamed Lucy, discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. The practical effects on the whole are really good, though some costumes do look better than others. The Australopithecus are one of the better ones in my opinion. The episode weirdly starts with Robert Winston in the middle of the forest at night in Pliocene Ethiopia 3.2 million years ago, looking through his own family history. I understand why they did this thematically, as the point is we can all eventually trace our ancestry back to a family of apes like Australopithecus, but Winston keeps pointing out stuff like how his relatives are making sulking faces and stuff, and it just comes across as weird. On that note, Robert Winston is so weird in this. He's so awkward and doesn't gel as well as I feel Nigel would in these scenarios. I feel that Nigel's more fun and energetic nature helps sell what are quite silly scenarios. Winston kind of just stands there smiling creepily most of the time, and he feels like he's just there. Or he'll make weird comparisons and jokes and it just feels very disconnected to the rest of the experience. It's so hard to put into words. A good example of what I mean is that he follows the life of Lucy in the first episode, seeing her interact with her other clan members, raise her baby, and get caught up in an intraspecific dispute over territory. During the latter event, Lucy climbs up into a tree to hide from her attackers, and Winston is just on another branch, smiling at her? It's just so bizarre and I find it hard to take seriously. Something worthy of note in this episode is that it oddly marks the only time in the Walking With series that we see the Miocene Epoch. As Winston decides it's rewind time and travels back another 5 million years or so, during this time travelling sequence, we see the formation of the Himalayas as the Indian subcontinent collided with mainland Asia. Also, hi Bacillosaurus! You would have been extinct for over 25 million years by this point, but sure. Caveman is also the only show where we travel backwards in time from the episode's established time period. The point of this scene is to show how Africa was once almost entirely covered by dense tropical forest, 
home to our chimpanzee-like ancestors. But as the climate gradually became drier, the forests opened up into savanna, forcing our ancestors to adapt to a more terrestrial lifestyle, resulting in the bipedal ape men like Australopithecus. I'm not sure why they did this though, as Winston is once again just there, suspended on a harness whilst modern animal footage is plazed, including what I assume are a mix of gibbons, chimps, and or bonobos, but are obscured by branches. I feel this could have just been stated with narration, rather than having this entire time-travelling sequence that feels out of place. The narration states that no fossil apes ancestral to humans are known from this time. Maybe these apes are meant to be Sailanthropus just one million years too early? The sequence then transitions to this beetle, it then gets eaten by Lucy despite seeming like it was alive five million years before she was? I, I don't know. The episode also uses stock footage from Next of Kin, but they put a weird filter over it so it's totally different. This episode does have some decent science in it. It's just presented in such a strange way that it's hard to dissect it and actually take it in when Robert Winston is talking about sex and chocolate biscuits. The episode ends with Lucy being killed by being hit with a stick by another Australopithecus whilst trying to protect her baby. Researchers have actually concluded that Lucy most likely died from falling out of a tree but this was found after production had ended. Her elder daughter adopts her baby, and Winston picks up Lucy's corpse and carries it a few feet down by a waterhole? What? So, closing thoughts on First Ancestors are that not much really happens. This is the reason I only wanted to do a single video for Cavemen as the individual episodes just don't have much going on, and there isn't that much to talk about. Story-wise, this episode is essentially a rehash of Next of Kin, but less interesting. It just feels really disjointed with it starting in the Pliocene, rewinding to the Miocene, then continuing in the Pliocene again. There's a lot of stock footage, and whilst it is fair that some modern animals were around at this time, there's a bit too much for my liking, and it just feels like padding, not the greatest start. The second episode, Blood Brothers, is arguably the most interesting, as it is structured in the form of a mystery, as we are presented with three types of ape men coexisting in early Pleistocene East Africa, two million years ago. Paranthropus boisei, Homo habilis, and Homo rudolfensis. And the episode poses the viewer the question, which of these are ancestral to humans? Now, judging purely from the genus names, with some very common knowledge, the average person can probably rule out one of them immediately essentially taking us down to a 50-50 situation, so the mystery element isn't as strong out of the gate. To further kick this episode while it's down, we later see that of the remaining two, one of them is barely even in the episode, which suggests it's probably not that one either. So that leaves one. What a mystery indeed. Okay, maybe I'm being too harsh. I at least praise them for tackling this angle, even if it didn't really work out that well. The first of the three ape men, Paranthropus boisei, has a cool design, but something about it just doesn't look convincing to me. Maybe it's just because I've watched the funny behind the scenes video on the DVD of the actors trying to eat whilst in costume. Yeah, I suppose I can let them off. They live in a harem system, with one dominant male mating with several females, the arrival of a new female spurs the male to ditch the elder female. Meanwhile, Winston is just watching this adultery through his binoculars. We then meet Homo habilis, who catches the pervert in the act and attacks his jeep. The makeup on the habilis looks really unkempt and does a good job of reflecting their more savage and reckless nature in comparison to the more laid-back Boise Eye. After seeing more stock footage from Next of Kin, we are briefly introduced to Homo rudolfensis, 
who honestly just looks like the Australopithecus. They might even be the exact same, honestly. As such, I have nothing to say about them. We then have another sequence detailing how the drying climate of the Ice Age resulted in the spread of grasslands, and therefore ruminant herbivores whose multi-chambered stomachs can process the gritty, low-nutrient grass. And boy, do they go into detail. You know, I could have lived my entire life blissfully unaware of how it would feel to be a turd. And yet, walking with cavemen decided, no, no, you will learn about how animals digest grass from within an antelope's hole. Is this walking with or the magic school bus? Jokes aside, I do appreciate that they're explaining the science behind it and how ape men have now diversified, but this highlights a big problem with cavemen. Pacing. This sequence on grass really has very little to do with human ancestry, and I felt that the previous episode already did a good enough job explaining how the drying of the climate led to the spread of grasslands, so I'm very confused why this episode decided to go so in depth. Caveman has a few scenes like this, and they just really break the pace of the episodes. It's interesting seeing how different the ape men are, as the Boisei are shown to be herbivores specialised in eating tough plants, whereas Hablis are shown to be generalist omnivores. I like that we first see them raiding a bee nest <coughs> before following vultures overhead to a deer carcass. We then get a proper introduction to Rudolphensis. 18 minutes into the 30 minute episode, who challenge the Hablis for the carcass before both troops are scared off by a lion who kills the lead male Hablis. <coughs> this is the only time you see Homo Rudolphensis, by the way. Really feels like they just threw in another ape man just for the sake of it. This is followed by a sequence of cool time lapse shots, but they don't add anything other than explaining again how the environment will change, and that the Boise Eye won't be able to adapt and become extinct. The narration then claims that Habilis were the first creatures to make stone tools, but this may not be the case, as this is nearly impossible to determine with only fossils. Regardless, it's really cool to see them use numbers to their advantage and scare the lion from the carcass, and then use their tools to extract the bone marrow. Strangely though, this episode ends with the narration explaining how the most likely ancestor of this time was actually none of the above, but instead Homo ergaster, the focus of the third episode. This just further confounds the point of the mystery angle this episode was trying to go for. If they had just simply set it a few hundred thousand years before ergaster had evolved, the answer would be Habilis to which the next episode could then more smoothly transition into Ergaster being the next step towards modern humans. Instead, cavemen decided to go psych. I appreciate that evolution is not neat and linear, but when the show is structured on showing different stages in our evolution, it just feels weird to set this episode specifically two million years ago when Ergaster was already about. Confusion aside, I enjoyed Blood Brothers more than First Ancestors, as it felt more focused and the story was more interesting to me. The Habilis were definitely the highlight for me. The third episode, Savage Family, starts out in Kenya 1.5 million years ago, and as I said before, focuses mostly on Homo ergaster. Just as a heads up, I apologise if there aren't a ton of screenshots for this episode, as there's a fair amount of nudity, and I'd like this video to stay up. It opens on a salt plain where a family of Ergaster have been tracking an old wildebeest for two days until it collapses from exhaustion. Right off the bat, the keying of the wildebeest onto the salt plain background is really not that good. The makeup on the Ergaster looks fantastic and I have to give major props to the actors here, as filming naked on a scorching hot and dry African salt plain put them highly at risk of sunburn and heat stroke, so well done to them for all staying in character. We see Ergaster as being the first human ancestors to have developed their own language, and to make sophisticated tools like simple axes, 
The narration also explains how they have a defining human characteristic, sweating, as well as having nearly hairless bodies to lose heat. They also have incredibly large brains that allow them to understand others of their own kind, as well as to take in information about the world around them. Their social groups are very complex, thought to be the first apes to form monogamous pairs and show what could be most simply described as friends and enemies. The narration describes Homo ergaster as being the first human ancestors to leave their ancestral home of Africa by following the river Nile to the Middle East before entering Asia, but that these specimens are referred to by, quote, a different name, Homo erectus. Some researchers find Homo ergaster to be the same as Homo erectus, but currently, most studies support ergaster as a valid species. The earliest known specimens of the genus Homo found outside Africa are the Dumanisi hominins that were discovered in Georgia and dated to 1.8 million years ago. Their classification, however, is disputed. Some researchers believe they are a population of Homo erectus, whereas others believe they are their own distinct species, Homo georgicus. It's really cool seeing erectus navigate through the dense bamboo forests of China, as well as how they use the sturdy plant to craft tools instead of stone. Here we see a very interesting creature indeed, the largest known primate ever, Gigantopithecus. Whilst described as the original King Kong, Gigantopithecus is thought to have been most closely related to the orangutans. Here it is portrayed entirely by a giant puppet, which is new for walking with, sitting and eating bamboo, and not just as a type of weird bipedal sasquatch slash yeti-like biped I imagine many cryptozoology fans so badly wish it was. We then have another time-lapse montage as we fast forward one million years. This, however, is one of the only times where I feel it's justified, as it is used to show how in a million years, Ergaster's technology has stayed the same and makes the point of how they still differ from modern humans in this regard. The episode ends with Winston stating that the next step involved taming fire, and he makes a campfire and a pair of Ergaster, who surely would have died over a million years ago, just sit with him around the fire, and he smiles stupidly at them. I... sure. Wow, Savage Family was a big improvement over the first two episodes. It still has weird Robert Winston, but it feels by far the most focused and actually had a new creature that wasn't recycled from Walking With Beasts. Easily my favourite episode so far. The fourth and final episode, The Survivors, starts out in Middle Pleistocene Britain 400,000 years ago. We see a family of Homo heidelbergensis hunting a megaloceros. The model is ripped straight from Mammoth Journey, and may even use the exact same animations, just keyed over a different background. One of the brothers gets injured and dies later that night. The next morning, Winston finds that his family have simply left his body, to which he tells us how strange it seems that Heidelbergensis don't honour their dead in any way, and that they can't imagine an obscure concept such as an afterlife. He decides to push over and repose the body before covering it with his fur pelt. Yeah, they're the weirdos. From here, we see that the Heidelbergensis populations in Europe become separate to those in Africa, with those in Europe having to adapt to the oncoming freezing ice sheets, and those in Africa to contend with the dry Ice Age climate's drought. We fast forward to 140,000 years ago, where we see that the European branch has become Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals. This part is really pretty and has the best storytelling aspect of the show. The harsh winter weather has forced most of the animals this clan of Neanderthals hunt to migrate south, and usually they would do the same, but the clan leader's partner is pregnant and most likely wouldn't survive such a long journey. The leader riskily decides to go on one last hunting trip, hoping they can find some food. It's so simple, yet it's genuinely good conflict. 
The narration outlines how their short stature and large noses are all adaptations to the cold climate. This part where this man falls and completely disfigures his finger and just snaps it back into place really stuck with me after I first saw it, not gonna lie. We later see them cooking and eating the rabbit they caught, and Winston, yet again, is just there, hanging out in a cave with them, I guess. After completely searching their hunting grounds to no avail, the men hear the trumpeting of mammoths. Yes, they are also the models from Mammoth Journey, but they are at least animated specifically for this scene, which I think is really cool. Speaking of Mammoth Journey, it's very interesting contrasting it to this episode, as both feature scenes of Neanderthals hunting mammoths, but there we were viewing from the perspective of the mammoths, whereas here we are with the Neanderthals. The way they take down one of the mammoths by waiting for them to get funneled into a ravine, then pushing a large rock off the ledge to then hit one of the mammoths is pretty brutal, but so is making them fall off a cliff, so I'll let you decide which is the worst way to go. Once again, we see the Neanderthals return to a cave to eat their catch, only to be followed by Winston to spy on them, but now also cracking a joke? <laughs> I can't make this up. It does, however, get the point across that Neanderthals lack imagination compared to modern humans. We then cut to the African branch of Hydrobagensis that has led to Homo sapiens, modern humans. The narration explains how they are taller and slimmer, which helps to cope with the intense desert heat, and their dark skin helps protect them from UV radiation from the sun. Winston decides that the most subtle way to observe early humans is in a giant hot air balloon? It's not even keyed in well over the stock footage background, so what is actually the point? It's really interesting to see the early humans have the complex ability of imagination and foresight to bury an ostrich egg full of fresh water in the ground to find if harder times before them. But then Winston comes and digs it out of the ground and drinks their precious water like an animal. The narration then states that 110,000 years ago, the Ice Age began to thaw, bringing more water to Africa again. However, from the research I've done, 110,000 years ago would have actually been towards the beginning of the last glacial period. 135,000 years ago would be a more appropriate date, as this would have been the beginning of the Eemian interglacial period, where the ice sheets would have been receding due to the Earth's Milankovitch cycle. From this, we then time jump one last time to 30,000 years ago to see the cave painters of Europe. It really is a fascinating idea to imagine what ancient people must have been thinking whilst creating these pictures. The narration then states that soon, the Neanderthals will become extinct due to them being snubbed out by the more imaginative humans. There are two issues with this. One is that Neanderthals were believed to have already been extinct by 40,000 years ago. The second is that it is now believed that Neanderthals were actually sunk into the human genome due to interbreeding with them, causing them to lose their genetic purity, essentially becoming absorbed by the human genetic code. The episode ends with Sir Robert Winston smiling at an unattended baby by a campfire, speaking to the audience about how he could potentially raise it as his own daughter and she'd be no different from any other person. What even is this show? Okay, so whilst I didn't enjoy The Survivors as much as Savage Family, I definitely liked it more than the first two. Walking with cavemen is weird. I can't call it bad, but when my standards for walking with are this astronomically high, it definitely falls short in areas. The pacing is all over. There's a lot of padding. The effects vary from fantastic to quite lazy. And above all, Robert Winston is a freak of nature. The cinematography and music by Alan Parker are genuinely really well done though, and the science on the whole has shockingly stood the test of time really well. Needless to say that this is easily the weakest instalment of the Walking With series for me. Granted, it is still leaps and bounds better than actual trash like Jurassic Fight Club and Clash of the Dinosaurs, 
Not a bad watch, but it's just not of the same calibre as its peers. Thank you all so much for watching, please do like, comment and subscribe, and I will see you all next time. Bye bye now.